the mightiest kingdom of men ever to exist. Maya Gavan and Melanine, and welcome to Tolkien Untangled's top 10 list of facts about the island nation of Numenor. Number 10. The Origins of the Island so, contrary to what you may expect, Numenor is not a naturally formed island. Prior to the Second Age, it didn't exist, and also after the Second Age, it doesn't exist. The island of Numenor was raised out of the ocean by the Vala Ulmo, the Lord of Waters, and the guy who gave the grandfather of Numenor's first king the vision that sped up the process of the Dark Lord Morgoth's ultimate defeat in the First Age. And Olamo raised this island as a gift, a gift to the descendants of these First Age men, the Edain, the three houses of Beor, Haleth, and Hador, who fought alongside the High Elves in their First Age wars against Morgoth. Which means the men of Numenor are the descendants of pretty much all the mannish heroes that we meet in the Silmarillion. And so, Numenorians really are not like other men in Middle-earth. They live on a divinely raised island that exists both literally and also figuratively halfway between the mortal lands of Middle-earth and the undying lands of Valinor in the uttermost west. And this is reflected in the men that live there. Numenorians are known, among other things, for their height. They stand on average at least six foot four, but many are way taller than that. We are told in The Lord of the Rings that Isildur stood seven feet tall, and his father Elendil, the tall, was almost eight foot. As a point of reference, Shaquille O'Neal stands at seven foot one, and the dude who played the mountain in Game of Thrones is only six foot nine. And it's not just their height that sets Numenorians apart, we are told that these men have lifespans that are thrice that of lesser men, around 210 years. Although the direct descendants of Numenor's first king can live almost double that. The third king of Numenor died at 411 years old, and the fourth king was 401 at the end of his life. Although, as Numenorean history moved forwards over the millennia, these lifespans did diminish a little bit. But there is no Numenorean who lived quite as long as their first king. And this segues me perfectly to number 9. Elrond's twin brother. So, obviously everyone has heard of Elrond, and if you're already familiar with Numenor's history, then you'll probably also have heard of his brother. But if you haven't, let me introduce you to Elros, one of the most underrated characters in the Second Age. And just like Elrond, Elros is half-elven. He is the son of an elf maiden called Elowing, the granddaughter of Beren and Luthien, by the way, and his father is the first 50 50 half elf ever to live, Earendil. And so the descendants of Elowing and Earendil have this choice. They are able to decide whether to live as mortals or immortals. Obviously, we all know Elrond chose to live as an immortal elf, and his daughter Arwen chose a mortal life and so too did her uncle Elros. But just because he lived a mortal life does not make Elros any less special than the rest of his family. So throughout most of his life, Elros was known as Tar Miniatur, which means in Sindarin, the first king. And that is of course because he became the first king of Numenor. Over the first century of the Second Age, he and his people, the descendants of the men from the Silmarillion, set sail and departed Middle-earth to colonize their new island home. And Elros went to Numenor with a few very cool artifacts. He brought his ancestor Beren's ring, the ancient ring of Barahir, which would of course one day be passed down through his descendants all the way to Aragorn, before he eventually gave it to Elros's niece, Arwen, as an engagement gift. And Elros also brought the Elven sword Aranruth that was once wielded by the Elven High King of the Sindar, Eluthingol, and presumably he also brought the dwarf forged blade Narsil, which would eventually be broken by Sauron and used by Isildur to cut the ring from his finger. 
Eleros established Numenor's capital, the great city of Arimenelos, from which he ruled for 410 years. And when Eleros did eventually die, it happened at the age of exactly 500. And Eleros was not slain in battle, or killed by sickness, or anything like that. He simply relinquished his life. His spirit departed the universe of Ea peacefully and voluntarily, as should have been the case for all mortals if Melkor had never corrupted the planet of Ardo way back in the beginning. And as it goes, there are very few men who get this privilege of relinquishing their life, but one of them is Eleros, and another is his great 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 and then 56 more greats grandson, Aragorn. Number 8. A very special island. So, Numenor is not small. In the Atlas of Middle-earth, it is estimated to be about 167,961 square miles across. That's slightly smaller than the nation of Iraq. But it's bigger than Germany, it's bigger than Japan, it's bigger than Norway, and it's not far off double the size of the UK. And as I'm sure you will notice, it has a rather unusual shape to it. Each one of the five points on this star has its own unique geographical features and local flora. Forastar is a land of high rocks and tremendous cliffs and a place where great eagles build their nests. Andustar is fertile and forested and home to the city of Eldalonde, the haven of the Eldar, where seafaring elves from the uttermost west came and traded and coexisted prosperously with the men of Numenor. Hieranustar is known for its wine and its fertile farmlands, Hiarostar is known for its timber and its white beaches, and Orastar is basically the breadbasket of the island. And in the middle are the central lands of Mithalamar, the grassy plains where we find Arimenelos, the capital, the eastern port city of Romena, the Valley of the Tombs, and right in the absolute centre of Numenor is the holy mountain of Menel Tarma, the pillar of the heavens, the tallest mountain on the island, and a sacred place to the Numenorians. No birds or animals live on the peak of Meneltarma save only for the great eagles of Manwe. And it is said that on a clear day, a far-sighted Numenorean standing on the mountain summit can just make out the island of Tol Eresea off the shores of Valinor. Number 7. Of Birds and Beasts so, I just mentioned eagles, and I will mention them again in just a second, but Tolkien actually tells us about quite a few different animal species that coexist with the Numenorians upon their mystical island. And being an island with an incredibly maritime culture, you probably won't be surprised to hear that fish and fishing make up a very important part of Numenor's heritage and traditions. We are told that the hardiest of the people were the fisher folk. Fish were abundant all about the coasts and were at all times a chief source of food. From the fisher folk were mostly drawn the mariners, who as the years passed grew greatly in importance and esteem. And fish aren't the only animals that affected the culture of Numenor's mariners. Seabirds abode in multitudes beyond reckoning and it was even said among the Numenorians that a blind sailor would be able to know that they were drawing near home just by hearing the clamour of the birds upon the shore. In fact, when any ship approached the land, seabirds in great flocks would arise and fly above it in welcome and gladness, for they were never killed or molested by intent. Some would accompany ships on their voyages, even those that went to Middle Earth. And I think it's a really cool detail that, well, at least in the beginning, the men of Numenor had such a symbiotic and positive relationship with the animals that they lived beside. Perhaps an even clearer example of this is the Numenorians' love of horses. We are told that both men and women took delight, and all the people of the land loved horses, treating them honourably and housing them nobly. They were trained to hear and answer calls from a great distance, 
And it is said in old tales that where there was great love between men and women and their favourite steeds, they could be summoned at need by thought alone. And there are a few other animals that the Numenorians have this really symbiotic, synchronised relationship with. I've already mentioned the mountain of Meneltarma and the great eagles of Manwe that fly above its peak. But these great eagles are more than just messengers of the Valar. They are a very significant part of Numenor's royal culture. We are told that whenever anyone approaches the summit of the heavenly mountain, at once three eagles would appear. And when the king said his prayers to Iluvatar, which I'll talk about in a few minutes, the eagles flew silently above him and became known as the witnesses of Manwe, sent from the uttermost west to keep watch over the mountain and over all of Numenor. In fact, we're even told that the great eagles were held sacred by the king of Numenor, at least in the beginning, and for 2,000 years there was an eyrie in the summit of the tower of the king's palace in Armenelos, and there one pair ever dwelt and lived on the bounty of the king. Number 6. The Trees of Numenor so, I just mentioned that in Eldalonde, white elven ships of the uttermost west would often make port in Numenor, and they would bring with them all kinds of wonderful things to enrich the island. And among the most wonderful of these things are the flowers and trees that they bring to Numenor from the uttermost west. And honestly, it just wouldn't be Tolkien, would it, if we didn't get a whole aside about trees. In the Unfinished Tales, we are told all about an area in the west of Numenor called Nisimalda, which means fragrant trees. We are told that flower, leaf, and rind of those trees exuded sweet scents, and all that country was full of blended fragrance. And this potentially makes Nisimalda a contender for one of my top favourite places in all of Arda. I mean, I love trees, and I love things that smell good. And fragrance isn't the only super pleasant thing about these trees. Tolkien gave them names that sound so wonderfully beautiful when said. Oyo Lyre, Lyre Lose, Vardariana, Taniquia Lese. These are just fun words to say. If you're bored or you're having a bad day, just say Oyo Lyre, Lyre Lose. I bet your day will get at least a tiny little bit better. And, to be honest, these names probably would sound even lovelier if only I were able to roll my R's, like Tolkien does. But the truth is, I just can't do it. I have tried so, so, so hard, but I just can't roll my R's. It's a daily source of shame. Anyway, of all the tree species in Numenor, perhaps the most iconic are the Malorn trees, made famous in the Third Age for being the gold and silver trees of Lothlorien. But the reason that Lothlorien has these Malorn trees is directly tied to Numenor. So technically, Malorn trees did not originate in Numenor, they originally grew in Valinor, and were then moved to the island of Tol Eresea by the High Elves of the Undying Lands. But in the Second Age, these High Elves brought Malorn seeds to Numenor, and they gave them as gifts to the Numenorians. And so, Numenor became the first place where mortals could dwell beneath the branches of Malorns, or Melion, that's how the Sindarin word should be pluralised. But it is thanks to Numenor's sixth king, Aldarion of Aldarion and Arendis fame, that Malorn trees find their way to Middle-earth. Aldarion gave a few Malorn nuts to his friend High King Gilgalad, but the trees would not grow in the colder northern climes of Lindon, so Gilgalad gave the nuts to his family member, Galadriel, and she took them east and planted them in the land that would later be known as Lothlorien. But we are told that as awesome and mighty as the Melian of Lothlorien were, they still did not grow quite as tall as in the groves of Numenor. However, the Malorn trees still aren't the absolute most iconic trees of Numenor because, of course, one of the island's best-known legacies and one of its most recognisable symbols 
is the White Tree of Numenor. And the story of this tree is so, so awesome. But to do it justice, we have to start at the beginning. So, in Tolkien's Legendarium, when it comes to magical trees, there really are two that shine brighter than all the rest. And I mean that literally, because of course, before the first rising of the sun, the uttermost west was lit by the two trees of Valinor, Laureline the Golden and Telperion the Silver. And of these two divinely created trees, it was Telperion the Silver, the Elder, that was the most beloved by the High Elves. So, as a gift to the Noldor and the Vanyar Elves who lived in the mighty city of Tyrion in Valinor, a second silver tree was created in Telperion's image within the city walls. And this one was called Galathilion. Now, many of you will probably know that Telperion and Laureline were both famously destroyed by Melkor and the demonic spider Ungoliant, which ended the Years of the Trees and plunged Valinor into darkness. But Galathilion survived. It gave off no light, so it wasn't particularly helpful, but it was beloved and it was created by the Valier, the goddess Yavanna. And over the years, Galathilion had many seedlings, but the most famous one was transported just outside of the realm of Valinor to the elven island of Tol Eresea that lies just off the coast. And there, that seedling grew into another incredibly iconic silver tree called Celeborn. Not to be confused with Galadriel's husband, Celeb Orn literally just means silver tree, and it was a seedling of Celeborn that was brought to Numenor by the seafaring elves of Tol Eresea. And this Numenorian silver tree was called Nimloth. It grew in the king's court in the capital city of Armenelos, and it blossomed at sunset, perfuming the night air in the king's garden. And throughout most of Numenor's history, this tree was a symbol of friendship and goodwill between the men of Numenor and the elves of the West. Except that goodwill did not last throughout all of Numenor's history, and neither did the tree. So I don't want to get too into spoilers, I'll talk about this in a lot more detail in good time, but when Sauron came to Numenor, he pretty immediately instigated a cult of Melkor worship, and he corrupted the already unfaithful Numenorians even further into darkness. And one of the first things that Sauron did was to have Nimloth cut down and burned to kindle the first fire in his temple of Melkor worship. But this is where we see an astoundingly heroic moment from my favourite Numenorean character, Isildur. I know that in the movies, Isildur is portrayed as a pretty corrupt and unlikable guy, and he's often talked about as being some sort of like a fallen hero or an anti-hero, but I don't think these are accurate descriptions of the character that Tolkien actually wrote. Isildur is a straight-up hero. I mean, it would have been nice if he destroyed the ring at the end of the Second Age, but that whole thing goes so differently in the books compared to the movies, and even the most unkind and mean-spirited reading of this character can't deny the fact that he was an awesome dude throughout almost every single moment of his life. And the first chronological moment of Isildur being an utter badass begins with the White Tree of Numenor. So just before Sauron and his followers have Nimloth cut down and burned, Isildur sneaks into the courtyard of the king and he almost dies trying to steal a fruit from this tree. This fruit he plants in secret, and it grows into a seedling which Isildur then carried with him to Middle-earth after the final downfall and ruin of Numenor. And this seedling of Numenor's white tree became the first white tree of Gondor. That tree was then also destroyed by Sauron's armies only nine years later, but once again Isildur rescued a sapling and he planted it in Minas Anor, which will later become known as Minas Tirith. And that second white tree of Gondor grew in Minas Tirith for 1,634 years, 
It did then die when a great plague struck Gondor and killed its king and all his children, but another seedling was planted by that king's nephew who succeeded him, and so this is the third white tree of Gondor. But after 1,232 years, this tree also died, and it is this dead tree that we see in the Lord of the Rings. For 147 years, the lifeless husk remains guarded in the court of the fountain, and it is not until Aragorn is finally crowned king, not until Isildur's heir finally returns, that the white tree blossoms again. And so, although the white trees of Gondor are massively important parts of Third Age history, and the two trees of Valinor are massively important parts of the Silmarillion and First Age history, it is in Numenor that these two periods are bridged together. Nimloth is a descendant of Galathilion and Celeborn, and it is also an ancestor of all the white trees of Gondor. And it is Isildur who makes all of that happen. Number 5. Numenor and the Wider World So, as wonderful as Numenor is, not all Numenorians stayed there. The sixth king of Numenor was that guy Eldarion, but before he became known as Tar Eldarion, he lived his life as a mariner and an explorer of Middle-earth. Now, Aldarion was not the first Numenorian ever to sail back to Middle-earth. The first Numenorian ships to arrive at the Great Havens were sent during the reign of Aldarion's grandfather, Elendil I, not to be confused with the much more famous Elendil. And the captain of these ships was a guy called Veantur, who, as it turns out, would also go on to be the grandfather of Aldarion through Aldarion's mother. But during Veantur's time in Middle-earth, he befriended the elven High King Gilgalad and Círdan the Shipwright. However, Númenor's maritime exploration really did take off during the lifetime of Aldarion. Before he took the scepter of the king, Aldarion established the Guild of Venturers, and he became known as the Great Captain. The guild's headquarters were located in no city, instead they were aboard a massive ship called Eambar. And during his pre-king years, Aldarion went on quite a few really, really long sea voyages, and he explored way more of Middle-earth than any of his ancestors before him. Aboard his ship, which was called the Palaran, he sailed to the Grey Havens where the super awesome Círdan the Shipwright taught him the elven arts of shipbuilding. And Aldarion also explored the southern coasts of Harad, and it's possible that he was the first Numenorian ever to discover the bay that would one day become the stronghold of the black Numenorians, Umbar. But he was also blown far to the frozen north of Middle-earth, and potentially up to the ice bay of Forachel. And Aldarion also journeyed up some of Middle-earth's rivers. He was the first Numenorian to discover the mouth of the river Guathlo, a name chosen by the Numenorians, and he even established a Numenorian haven there called Vinya Londe, which survived into the Third Age as the ancient port city that became known as Londdaya Eneth. And he even went upriver to a place now known as Tharabad, where not only did Aldarion begin the construction of what would go on to become one of Middle-earth's most ancient cities, he also met the one and only Galadriel. And Aldarion was also the first Numenorian who first perceived that evil was growing in Middle-earth, and that the rise of Sauron all the way across the sea might still be an important thing for the Numenorians to keep an eye on. He began a close friendship with Gilgalad, and together they built the foundations of what would, in many, many, many thousands of years, become the Last Alliance. Over the generations, more and more Numenorean adventurers explored more and more of Middle-earth, and they began to set up more and more permanent settlements, basically Numenorean colonies on the continent. The biggest and most famous of these being the massively important cities of Pelargir and Umbar, one of which would become a seat of power for the faithful Numenorians, and then later become the oldest city in Gondor, 
and the other would go on to be the home of the black Numenorians in Middle-earth, the unfaithful, the king's men who would go on to be great enemies of Gondor and great allies of Sauron. And I think there's one more very interesting thing that the Numenorian explorers discovered in Middle-earth, and that is precious metals. We're told that Numenor was rich in iron and copper and like useful metals for making tools, but they had no gold or silver. Instead, they had the stunning gold and silver Malorn trees and gifts from the High Elves and near perfect natural beauty. But when the Numenorians first discovered gold and silver in Middle-earth, it seems that something was awakened inside them, a type of greed, a lust for material wealth, and a discontentment at the natural wonders that they were so generously endowed with. And to be honest, this preference for gold and silver metals over gold and silver trees really is the first hint at a shadow falling over Numenor, the first crack in an otherwise seemingly perfect paradise, the first step on the road to ruin. Number four, the gods of Numenor. So typically, organized religion really isn't a thing in Middle-earth, and it makes a lot of sense, why not? Belief in the Valar and the Maya really isn't a matter of faith in this world, it's, it's like a fact, it can't really be disputed. Like Numenor was literally raised out of the ocean by Ulmo. The eagles above Meneltama were literally sent there by Manwe. It's not that the people believe that, Tolkien presents it as a fact of history. And so there's really not much need for like rituals or prayers in Middle-earth. People just kind of revere the Valar in their own way, and the Valar don't really demand any kind of worship. But a possible exception to this rule are the religious practices of Numenor. I guess throughout Numenor's history, there really are three main beings that are actively worshipped, but none of them are Valar. First, and least powerful of the three, is the Maya Uwienen. Now, the Maya are kind of like the angels or the demigods of Tolkien's Legendarium. They're a step below the pantheon of the Valar, but Uwienen is a very special Maya because she is the Lady of the Seas and the Quieter of Storms. Uwienen is married to the Maya Ose, and he is like the Lord of Storms and Coastal Waters, but Uwienen is the one who calms him. Uwienen is the one who brings fair weather and safe seas. And so, among the maritime culture of Numenor, Uwienen is particularly revered and beloved, especially by sailors. In fact, that guild of venturers that I mentioned a moment ago were also known by the name Uwienendili, the lovers of Uwienen. However, the main deity of Numenor, the one who is worshipped upon the peak of Menel Tarama, is Eru Iluvatar himself, the One, the All-Father, the creator of the universe, the source of the Maya and Valar, and the father of all elves and men. And in the Numenorian worship of Iluvatar, we see some relatively unique things among Tolkien's writings. The Numenorians celebrate three religious festivals a year, known as the Three Prayers. First in the year is the Eru Kierame, a celebration of spring. Second is the Eru Laitale, which is celebrated on midsummer. And finally, the Eru Hantale, a kind of Thanksgiving celebration at the end of the harvest and the onset of winter. And on all three of these holy days, the king or queen of Numenor would walk a winding road up to the peak of Menel Tarma at the head of a white clad procession. The three eagles, the witnesses of Manwe, would fly overhead and every member of the crowd would be utterly silent. In fact, it was decreed that absolutely no one should ever speak a word upon the peak of Menel Tarama except for the ruling king or queen who may whisper a prayer once on each of these three days. And for many thousands and thousands of years, this was how worship worked in Numenor. But then the shadow began to fall. So... 
you know that scene in Star Wars where Palpatine is talking to Anakin and he says something along the lines of, Did you ever hear the tragedy of Darth Plagueis the Wise? He became so powerful he could even save others from death. And then Anakin's like, is it possible to learn this power? To which Palpatine replies, not from a Jedi. Well, if we replace the words Jedi with Valar, and Darth Plagueis with Melkor, and Anakin with Artharazon, that's Numenor's last king, and Palpatine with Sauron, this is pretty much exactly how Numenor turns to the dark side too. In the later years of Numenor's history, long after the shadow first fell on them, the kings of Numenor became more and more envious of the elves, and more and more resentful of the limitations placed upon them by the Valar, and especially the gift of death that comes from Iluvatar himself. Numenor's last king, this Artharazon, became so terrified of death that Sauron was able to seduce him away from the worship of Iluvatar entirely. And instead, the king and his men began to worship Melkor, believing Sauron's lies that Melkor could deliver them from death. And this is both one of the absolute coolest stories in the Legendarium, and also one of the darkest. Sauron ordered the construction of a vast domed temple to be built right in Armenelos, right in the capital. And this temple was for the worship of Melkor. And turns out, Melkor is not worshipped by silently praying atop a mountain. Melkor worship requires human sacrifice. And this is what Sauron did to Numenor. He became the high priest of the temple, and the Numenorians who remained faithful to Iluvatar and the elves of the west were put to death on the altar of Melkor. Now, of course, this was obviously all a deception, didn't work, and honestly, I don't even think that Sauron was genuine in his worship of Melkor. I get the impression that the return of his old boss was the last thing that Sauron actually wanted, but his lies did eventually succeed in wiping Numenor off the map. Number 3. The Legacy of Numenor so, I've already talked about the Numenorean colonies in Middle-earth and their early interactions with the indigenous middlemen of that continent, but as the generations wore on, this formerly positive relationship turned darker and darker. As the Numenoreans split into the Kingsmen and the Faithful, the Numenorean colonies split too. Places like Pelagia remained friendly to the Elves and Men, but further in the south, beyond the reach of Gil-galad's influence, the king's men served Sauron openly, and they established their havens in Umbar and Harad. And these king's men, who would later go on to be known as the Black Numenorians, were not kind to the natives they encountered. In the days of Aldarion, the Numenorians came to the middlemen as friends and teachers, but towards the end of their civilization, they were conquerors and subjugators and tyrants. The black Numenorians levied immense taxes against the local men, and they took a huge amount of their wealth for their own. However, there is another side to this Numenorian legacy, because after the downfall of Numenor and the drowning of many of the king's men, there were some among the faithful who survived, and they set sail from Numenor in the final moments of the island's existence, and the lord of these exiled Numenorians was Elendil, the famous one. Along with his sons and a number of faithful Dunedain, Elendil took seven ships and he sailed east for Middle-earth to establish new realms for his people in exile. These seven ships were separated in the downfall and three landed in the north of Middle-earth while the other four landed in the south. In the north, Elendil established the Land of the King, which is known in Sindarin as Arnor. And in the south, his sons Anarion and Isildur established the lands of stone, much better known as Gondor. 
And so, when we see Aragorn and the Rangers of the North in The Lord of the Rings, and we're told that they're, like, different from other men, for they are Dúnedain, they are men of the West, this is what that means. The Rangers of Arenor are the last of Elendil's faithful exiles in the North, and the much more prosperous kingdom of Gondor is a key part of Númenor's legacy too. It is because of this Númenorian blood that Aragorn lives such a long time and ages so slowly. And it's also why Gondor is so much more, like, physically impressive than other Manish kingdoms such as Rohan or Dale. Gondor was founded with Numenorean science and Numenorean knowledge. They used arts that later in the Third Age became lost. But the legacy of Numenorean skills can still be seen even by the time of The Lord of the Rings. We are told that the Numenorians were able to build with a type of unbreakable black rock that's described as looking a bit like obsidian. And they used this rock to build the outer walls of Minas Tirith. So, although this isn't how it's portrayed in the movies, the White City of Minas Tirith is actually encased by a gleaming black wall of unbreakable stone. And I guess an even more iconic example of this Numenorean building that lasts long into the Third Age is Saruman's Tower of Orthanc. Long before Saruman ever even arrived in Middle-earth, the Numenorians built an unbreakable tower to house one of their palantiri. Tolkien tells us that Orthanc was fashioned by the builders of old, yet it seemed a thing not made by the craft of men, but riven from the bones of the earth in the ancient torment of the hills. So, next time you look at Orthanc, consider that although it's most famous for becoming Saruman's tower, for way more than half of its lifetime, this was a Gondorian tower, built at the beginning of Gondor's history and fashioned using the lost knowledge of Númenor. Number 2. Sauron's Finest Moment Alright, so, I think Sauron is my favourite villain in all of Tolkien's writings, and although he has many, many awesome moments in all three ages, Sauron's absolute devastation of Númenor has got to be the most badass thing he ever does. Now, this is potentially a very, very, very long story, and one day I'll go into it fully, but the short version is that during the Second Age, Sauron slowly gained more and more power and dominion over Middle-earth, until it got to the point that the only places not under his rule were the elf kingdoms in the north. The men of Middle-earth belonged to Sauron. And so, Sauron began calling himself, among other things, the King of Men. And this did not sit well with the King of Númenor. By this time in the story, Númenor's throne belonged to an absolute dick called Artharazon, the Golden. And he considered himself the King of All Men. So, as you do, Artharazon took that title for himself, and he decided he'd hammer the point home by capturing Sauron and making him his servant. Pharazon spent five years preparing an army, and then he launched his armada and landed it in the black Numenorean haven of Umbar. And this must have been one of the mightiest armies ever to march through Middle-earth. Their only possible rivals would be like the high elven armies of the Noldor that arrived back in the First Age to do war with Melkor. And we know this because the armies of Pharazon the Golden marched all the way to Mordor without even a single shred of resistance from the Dark Lord. In fact, when Pharazon arrived before the Black Gate, Sauron put on a fair form and he walked out of Mordor alone to surrender. And of course, in his arrogance, Pharazon saw nothing dodgy about this whatsoever, and so he stripped Sauron of all titles and took him back to Númenor as a hostage and a prisoner. And from Sauron's perspective, this is where the fun begins. Because, of course, Sauron knew that as long as Númenor existed, he would never really be the king of all men, and so Númenor had always been on his hit list. 
But orcs are terrified of the ocean and the island could never possibly be conquered by like conventional means. So instead of using orcs, Sauron conquered Numenor with ideology. As I've already explained, he preyed upon Pharazon's growing fear of death and he used the worship of Melkor as a means to corrupt the Numenorians into self-destruction. Pretty immediately, Sauron went from a prisoner to the king's most trusted chief advisor, and then to the high priest of Melkor's temple. He told the Numenorians that Melkor was the true giver of freedom, and that Iluvatar was nothing but a lie invented by the Valar as a way of keeping men from rebelling. Before long, ascending Menel Tarma became a crime, punishable by death. And as I've already mentioned, under Sauron's instruction, the white tree Nimloth was cut down and burned. Human sacrifice became the norm, not only in Numenor, but also in the colonies of Middle-earth. Faithful Numenorians and native middle men were burned in the fires of Melkor's temples. And so, in time, Pharazon became the greatest tyrant that the world had known since Melkor himself. Except, of course, the strings were really being pulled by Sauron. In fact, Sauron eventually convinced Pharazon that the only way to achieve the immortality that he craved would be to take it through conquest. Sauron urged the Numenorians to build the greatest fleet that had ever set sail, and to declare war on the uttermost west, to declare war on the Valar, and by extension, on Iluvatar himself. After nine years of preparations, the Great Armament finally set sail for Valinor, and our Pharazon became one of the only mortals ever to set foot in the Undying Lands. And the truth is, the Valar let him do this. This is such an unprecedented act of aggression that they all just kind of step back and let whatever happens happen. And what happens is that Iluvatar intervenes. This almost never happens. Iluvatar dwells outside of the universe in the timeless halls, and the only times we ever really see him at work are when he nudges events into place that allow for goodness to prevail. Except this time, Iluvatar doesn't nudge our Pharazon, he puts forth his power and changes the world. A great chasm opened in the sea between Numenor and the Deathless Lands, and the waters flowed down into it, and the world was shaken, and all the fleets of Numenor were drawn down into the abyss, and they were drowned and swallowed up forever. The island of Numenor was utterly destroyed, all its gardens, all its treasures, all its people swept into the abyss. Now, it's true that Sauron's body was also destroyed in the downfall of Numenor, but that wasn't really a problem for him. He got better. Somehow, his incorporeal spirit was able to transport the One Ring back to Mordor, and only 110 years later, he'd conquered Isildur's new Gondorian city of Minas Ithil, and he was burning another white tree. So to be honest, it's hard to see the drowning of Numenor as anything but an absolute win for Sauron. Number one. Tolkien's dream. All right, this fact may not be quite as awe-inspiring as Iluvatar breaking the world and destroying an island, but this is my favorite fact about Numenor, because it ties Numenor so intimately to its creator. So, in his many letters, Tolkien wrote relatively frequently about a terrible recurrent dream that often afflicted him. And in this dream, Tolkien saw, in his own words, the great wave towering up and coming in ineluctably over the trees and green fields. In another letter, Tolkien wrote that the wave would either come out of the quiet sea or come in towering over the green inlands. It always ends by surrender, and I awake gasping out of deep water. And Tolkien called this dream his Atlantis complex, or his Atlantis haunting. 
And what's especially cool is that the Quenya word for the downfallen is Atalante. Now, Tolkien claims it's just a happy accident that Atalante sounds so similar to Atlantis, but either way, the story gets even better. Because the dream was inherited by his second son, Michael Tolkien. And what's crazy is that, again, in Tolkien's words, I did not know that about my son until recently, and he did not know it about me. And there's even more. Because within the fiction of The Lord of the Rings, this dream crops up again. Tolkien wrote that he bequeathed the dream to Faramir. And in The Return of the King, we get some dialogue between Faramir and Eowyn, which includes some very familiar wording. Faramir speaks of Numenor and of the great dark wave climbing over the green lands and above the hills and coming on. Darkness unescapable. I often dream of it. Now, in the movies, this dream is given to Eowyn, but it came from Tolkien's own subconscious. He wrote that when Faramir speaks of his private vision of the Great Wave, he speaks for me. That vision and dream has been ever with me. But in 1955, Tolkien wrote once more about his dream, but this time it was after he'd finished writing the Akalabeth, which is the part of the Silmarillion where we're told this whole tale of Arpharazon and Sauron and the drowning of Numenor. And in reference to this dream, Tolkien wrote, I don't think I have had it since I wrote the downfall of Numenor as the last of the legends of the first and second age. Now, I'm no psychologist, I'm no dream scientist, but I find it so amazing that Tolkien had this profound recurring dream in real life and it inspired such a central part of his legendarium. But then, when he finally finished writing that part of the legendarium, when the tale of Numenor was finally told, the dream disappeared. In the words of Faramir, perhaps it was but a picture in the mind. Anyway, there's my 10 facts on the epic history of Numenor, and in the relatively near future, I'll upload another Tolkien Top 10s video. I have a few topics already in my mind, but feel free to share suggestions for future Top 10 lists in the comments below. And of course, to make sure you don't miss either that or any of my weekly First Age videos, hit subscribe if you haven't already, and don't forget to hit like and share this channel with your friends if you want to. But, as always, until next time, my dear friends, much love. Stay groovy and Nevaya Melanine.